this whole idea of, of virtue ethics as a way of informing both property and intellectual property has been percolating in my mind since I did my BPhil. Um, and it's, so I have, to, I have to give you that context. There, when I was working on my DPhil way back uh, at the other place, as you like to call it here, um, it, there were a lot of, I, I used to be a bit of a philosophy junkie. So while I was, in, while I was doing my DPhil in law, I would go to lectures by Bernard Williams and Philippa Foote, all these great uh, Oxford analytic philosophers uh, who were working in the Aristotelian tradition. So there were lectures on Aristotle, lectures on virtue, and that sort of thing. And it had an impact on my work. At the time I wrote my thesis, I had to create a neologism uh, in the title of my doctoral thesis um, that tried to capture what I thought were non-rights-based elements of property. You know, so I was doing my, my, my thesis with, with the late Jim Harris uh, in property theory. And couldn't find a word for what I was trying to articulate. Graduated from Oxford, uh, left, started teaching at McGill, started teaching property, left this aside um, because it didn't seem to it didn't seem to resonate with any publishers, um, but did resonate with my students. And then all of a sudden, the whole term virtue ethics began to be used, sort of around the year two thousand. Um, and so for about the last 10, 12 years, there's been a new virtue ethics school based on the writings of Philippa Foote and Bernard Williams and others, uh, Iris Murdoch. Um, and uh, so now I have terminology. You know, I have a, and, and so now it's time to come back to it. Uh, it's time to come back to it because there are people working in the field. Um, and I've also discovered a community of, of property scholars in particular, of which Kevin Gray is a part. Uh, so-called social obligation school or progressive property types. We meet, we meet at least once a year. And, it, and, it, and now it seems that there's a community of people out there uh, who are thinking about property in the same way that I've tried to think about it. Uh, and increasingly a group of intellectual property scholars uh, who are also uh, thinking about property uh, in these various ways. So people like uh, Michael Madison and Madhavi, Madhavi uh, Sundar and Anna Pamchander and, and a number of other people, particularly again in North America. So um, the time is ripe to put together, uh, put together my thoughts uh, and put together a book. So again, this is at the beginning stages. It's been delayed uh, for a bit for a variety of different reasons, uh, but I do hope to, to begin to put, start stringing chapters together uh, as early as, uh, as early as the next few weeks when in theory I have to write uh, what will become chapter one, but as part of another collection. <laughs> so, um, so, let me, so, so my goal here is just to introduce you to this way of thinking, uh, in this case about intellectual property. Um, and I'll make a few, uh, a few comments to show how I would extend it out to, to property as well. Um, this was part of a, a more sprawling lecture, so I'm going to skip a lot of slides, um, but uh, I'll make the slides available to anybody who... who uh, they're on this computer, but I, I can send you a copy, and that's fine. Um, there were a number of different parts to the lecture. Uh, there, the first part was uh, about what's wrong with copying. Right? Is copying so bad? Uh, the second part went through a, a backgrounder with respect to copyright, which Lionel Bentley's in the room. I don't need to do it uh, here. You can just ask Lionel. Uh, and then the third part, uh, third part moving into what virtue ethics might add. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the first part just because it's fun, and then I'll and then I'll go to the last part. So copying always wrong. That was the first question. Um, so is copying always wrong, even if an intellectual property statute, a copyright act, statute of an, uh, or or, um, or other, the uh, American U.S. Copyright Act, um, tells us it's wrong. Right? We see the term piracy being used by the recording industry uh, for both exact copying and what Americans call derivative works under their statute. Uh, we see the term being used by the big copyright entities of the day, such as Disney. Uh, and and uh, we see media campaigns before films and that sort of thing that try to tell us that that uh, taking 
taking a song or taking a film is the exact same as, as stealing a car. Um, so let me give you seven examples from the realm of copyright, and, and in part, uh, my first two slides are courtesy of Michael Madison. Um, this is uh, Van Gogh copying uh, Millet, uh, an example that I think some of you know about. Uh, you've probably all heard of Van Gogh. Uh, some of you would have heard of Millet as well, who was a realist painter uh, of the previous century. Uh, Millet is on the left, Van Gogh is on the right. Um, Van Gogh took roughly 21 paintings, uh, 20 or 21 paintings by Millet, and um, repainted them almost exactly, but not quite, right? He, the realist is on the left, uh, Van Gogh's, uh, I suppose, style of, of uh, post-impressionist work is on the right. Right? Very different paintings, much more, there's a different kind of expression in Van Gogh's painting, you know, it's the same subject matter and the same and color and light and all the rest of it. Um, another example, uh, shearing sheep again, uh, Millet on the left, uh, Van Gogh on the right. Um, a bit more different, uh, some more difference in, in light, I suppose, uh, and color here, as well as the, the obvious difference between a realist and a a realist painting and Van Gogh's uh, expression of the same subject. Um, in his, in his uh, letters to Theo, his brother, Van Gogh said he was translating Millet for another audience um, and made, uh, made reference to the educational function here that, that he was performing. If uh, you know, in, in, in the world we currently live in, uh, this would have been a copyright infringement, 1852, 1889. In the world we currently live in, this would have been a copyright infringement. Um, famous American case of Art Rogers and Jeff Koons, um, which uh, a number of you may have at least read or studied. Uh, Art Rogers, a uh, photographer, uh, took this black and white photograph, which uh, Put a label on Jeff Koons, but he's all, he's always in the paper for some controversy or, or another, including a couple of weeks ago. Um, Jeff Koons buys this in the in the hotel lobby. Uh, it's a black and white postcard. Buys it in a hotel lobby, sends it to his artisans in northern Italy, and they make a three-dimensional barrelief uh, and paint it. So it's made out of wood, carved one on the right, and painted. Uh, adds the color, adds the flowers on, on the ears and on the puppy's noses, um, but continually instructs his artisans to um, uh, copy it exactly. Right? In the notes, he's saying, please copy it exactly. Please copy it. Too, you're too far from the picture. Copy it exactly. Um, Art Rogers finds out about it, sues Jeff Koons. Uh, the Americans in their Copyright Act have something called derivative works, so it isn't just uh, as, as in, in the Anglo... Canadian tradition, you just compare copies, uh, quantity and quality. Uh, there's an additional test in the, that you know, one work is derived from the other, and that fell under this category. Uh, Coons argued that this was fair dealing, that he'd created fair, fair use, he created a new work. Um, indeed, he said he was trying to create, uh, he, this was a parody. Right? And the beauty of parody is that it inverts the idea expression dichotomy, right? That we traditionally think about copyright. We use, usually you have, there are multiple expressions of the same idea. With, with parody, you have, you have the same or a similar expression of wildly different ideas. And in this case, Kuhn's argument was he was, trying to, he was trying to represent the banality of everyday life. And indeed, this, this Bar-Yev formed part of a series of seven Bar-Yev which uh, were part of something he called the banality show. Um, he lost. Uh, he lost on the fair use arguments and the parody arguments, although most academic commentators in the United States think this was wrongly decided. Uh, he won on other, he won on, in other cases, uh, but he lost on this one. Um, did, he's a controversial figure, he made a lot of money selling this work, uh, he's, he's not well liked in the artistic community, at least by everybody, um, he's liked in other quarters. Did he do something wrong? Right? Is this is this a new work? Is it a justified copying? The the at least the American Copyright Act, as this court has has interpreted, uh, 
can't, I think it was the Second Circuit uh, Federal Court of Appeals, um, said it was wrong. Uh, third example, uh, famously, the Obama Hope poster, which uh, Shepard Ferry, another controversial uh, postmodern artist in the United States, uh, took from an Associated Press photograph. Uh, we don't know the outcome of this because they settled. Uh, and part of, the, uh, part of the terms of the settlement was confidentiality. Uh, but we can imagine that uh, either Ferry had to pay something and then divulge any further, uh, and divulge a percentage of further sales, um, or just has to do the latter. I mean, we don't know the terms, but at the very least, we know that money is going from Ferry to Associated Press for the use of the photograph. Um, it's a, Associated Press has a certain mission in terms of news reporting. Uh, is the poster a new work? Does it do something different? Is it the same as the photograph? Even if it was, in a sense, copied, uh, copied from the photograph. Okay. Yeah. Same question. Yeah. Maybe <coughs> legally wrong. Uh, is it wrong? Um, another example, uh, sorry about the overkill. This one really gets me angry. Um, I, I don't know if you know about this case. Uh, Gaylord against the United States. Uh, Gaylord is the uh, sculptor who was commissioned uh, to sculpt the, uh, this is the memorial for the Korean War veterans on Washington Mall. Um, very powerful work as, as all of the various, uh, I find Washington Malls, the, the various monuments, war monuments on Washington Mall are, are, are amazing, uh, particularly in Vietnam. Uh, veterans no more. But 50 years later, uh, 50 years after the police action that we now know as the Korean War, um, the, the U.S. Post Office uh, had a competition for a commemorative stamp. And the winning photograph became the stamp. And it is that sculpture under snow. Um, it's a beautiful photograph. I, in many ways, like it better than the sculpture. Uh, it is striking. Um, Gaylord found out, and despite the fact he'd already been paid once by the American government for this commission, uh, he sued the American government again. He didn't sue the photographer for obvious reasons. The, the U.S. government has deeper pockets. And he won. Um, he won on the copyright uh, infringement. Now, technically, there's a different copyright in the photograph. Um, what about the millions of people who take photographs of, of that morning? Um, and, and what about the public aspect of this? You know, isn't there something, something strikes me as wrong that someone who's been paid from the public purse to create a work of art then, uh, then claims to, to, uh, to, to sue that same government when someone takes a picture of it. Now, um, yes, it's a derivative work, I suppose, but to me, it's a new work. Uh, again, a completely different work uh, than that first work. Um, but you know, legally, uh, uh, some people differ, uh, including Gaylord and including the, the court that awarded him damages here. Um, I, won't, I won't put the link up. Uh, if any of you, if some of you may have seen this uh, famous Danger Mouse video, uh, the um, Jay-Z, an American rapper, properly so-called, uh, took uh, a song from the White Album by the Beatles, uh, whose name now escapes me, uh, and created, uh, created a, a mashup of that song um, on his very popular Black Album. Um, DJ Danger Mouse took the, uh, took the two and mashed them together in what he called the Grey Video. Um, and you can, you can, if you just, uh, if you just uh, Google Grey Video, you can watch it. But it, it begins with the Beatles playing their song, and then they slowly, uh, Jay Z is added in, and then, and then Danger Mouse is added in. So that's a, a definite copyright violation. There were threats uh, of, of copyright suits in that particular case, but they, they eventually, uh, the Beatles um, uh, copyright holder eventually backed down uh, and just let it go. But there are. Two borrowings here, the first by Jay-Z, right, the first sampling of the Beatles song and recreating a new song, and then the, 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 the mashup uh, by Danger Mouse of the whole, of the, the two uh, 
which, which uh, comprises a new whole. Again, it's copying, but is it a new work at the end of the day? My, my son loves rap uh, and loves Jay-Z, uh, thinks he's one of the best rappers going. Um, these kinds of things happen all the time. They produce new kinds of music. Yes, they're copying. Should we uh, should we put them in the in, in, should we put it in the same category as the person who uh, just makes Beatles CDs and sells them in the market somewhere, or takes takes even just takes Beatles songs on the internet and re uh, reposts them or reshares them or even resells them? Um, there's an argument here that the mashup is something different. Uh, and Latin second mashup example is Girl Talk, who using a laptop takes music, distorts it, bends it, creates music. Um, uh, extremely popular uh, dance music, uh, in particular, has concerts with his laptop, which people dance. Uh, which people dance. Uh, sometimes you can recognize the bass song. Sometimes they are so distorted that you can't. Um, again, to a different, a different kind of, uh, uh, different kind of uh, music that's being created here. Um, so maybe copying in the sense of violating copyright isn't so unequivocally bad, and at the very least, there might be something uh, that is uh, intuitive about copying. Right? The idea that, and here I'll skip through a number of slides, but the idea that we need, we need to copy to learn. Uh, copying's always been part of the way we learn. Uh, copying uh, manuscripts, for example, in, in medieval times, um, copying to learn in a school, copying to learn how to play a musical instrument, right? the, the argument that Mozart um, began composing, as we all know, at the age of four. Uh, Mozart scholars, uh, the last, listening to a documentary on the CBC, uh, just before I left uh, Canada for Italy, um, about Mozart and, and the fact that his genius didn't really begin to exert itself or exhibit itself until he was about 21 or 22. And most of the music that he wrote from, from the age of four to the age of 20 was really just reworking, uh, recopying, reworking traditional music, uh, classical music as he know it, knew it. And then at that, that point, when he became such a master at it, he then moved the paradigm and created true works of genius, uh, original works of genius. Um, and a lot of pedagogues will tell you that, that that's the way we all learn. You know, we learn by copying, and then at some point we get to the point where we can, we can move it beyond uh, simple copying. Um, uh, Van Gogh, retranslating, working on his technique and retranslating uh, Mille for another audience. Um, Michael Madison makes a great deal of this in terms of the, the curative uh, function of of copyright as being something that's supposed to perform or help perform this educational role, and copying, uh, copying has a vital role uh, in that, uh, in that analysis. Um, so I'll skip through this. There, the idea here was to look at the various various traditional documents in, in copyright statute of Anne and that sort of thing, and to examine the question of copyright fostering creativity, which is part of the utilitarian. Justification that we've come to uh, realize is the dominant narrative for copyright. Um, empirically, it may not be true, um, and hence we 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 may want to uh, think about uh, we may want to think about uh, other metaphors, so not necessarily creation but adaptation, as Jessica Littman would argue, um, fits with some of the examples we've seen of the of the paintings and the mashups. Um, But also, to, we, we, we might be challenged to think about other candidates that help inform the narrative. I do think creativity still forms part of the, has to form part of the justification, justification for copyright. Uh, it's, done, it's done a fair bit of good work so far in terms of helping us to understand the institution of copyright. And I don't want to be guilty of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, so uh, there are other candidates, and, and one of them, I'm just going to really run through this, um, is this idea of virtue, that copyright might be a way uh, 
of helping us to develop individual and, and collective virtues. And therefore, we need to understand some parts of copyright, not all parts of copyright, but, but maybe virtue will help us understand some of the trickier parts uh, of, of copyright uh, discourse. Um, Aristotle, the idea of virtue is how to live a good life, uh, how as individuals we need to find the mean using practical reasonableness uh, in terms of our own actions. Um, with respect to so both a method and substance, uh, with with respect to IP, um, what does the substance of method, the substance, or the method of virtue ethics, there should be an or not an of, uh, bring to the table? Um, well, we might think uh, we might think of, of copyright rules as fostering sharing and generosity. Uh, you know, Aristotle had said friendship uh, in the politics is one of the reasons why we had private property, so that we could we could be generous with others and, and bolster friendship. Um, think about kids sharing files, music files. There's a, there's a great deal of social interaction there. I mean, it's something I will talk about Monday because it's in the paper that I, I circulated uh, on on virtue ethics and file sharing with respect to music files. It's a way that kids develop socially and. That's something that probably hasn't been, uh, up until now, uh, weighed into the, the foundational discourse or the justificatory discourse in terms of understanding what the appropriate uh, rules ought to be. Um, <clears throat> knowledge. I mean, we, we, I'm an academic. We're academics here in, in some <clears throat> at, very, at different stages of our careers. But certainly I take this seriously with respect to um, uh, the way I share uh, as an academic. Um, but uh, there's a responsibility here. Uh, virtue ethics doesn't mean that I can do what I want with other people's texts. I made this point uh, last evening. As an academic, <clears throat> putting together my course, <coughs> I would never photocopy uh, an academic text produced for the academic market. And, and give it to my students. I just don't think that's right. right? Um, people, uh, colleagues, and publishers have put together these texts, usually at, you know, with editing, with care, at a price for the student market, um, destined for the student market. So it, if I'm going to assign that text, I will ask the students to buy it. Um, I, I don't think it's right to photocopy it in whole or in part. On the other hand, we as academics all share PDF files. Uh, it's become one of the new norms on, on SSRN. Um, there I don't hesitate uh, to share those, those papers that are up there, and I hope that people will share mine. Um, so it's, it's, it, uh, you know, there are responsibilities in the, the virtue ethics approach. The whole idea is to understand, in a nutshell, understand your context, um, and uh, understand your context understand the goal of what the, the rule is trying to propose. And if the rule falls short or seems counterintuitive, I think there will be times when it is justified uh, to go against the formal norm. There are also a fair number of social norms in this context, especially in copyright, that are also informed by virtue ethics. So, talked about file, uh, talked about sampling before as between musicians. There are informal norms as between the record companies which say, your artist can sample our, can, your artist can sample our music, our artist can sample your music, everybody's happy. Or there's a 30 second rule, I think it may have gone down now, but at one point there was a 30 second, you can sample 30 seconds, but don't sample more. Um, they don't always hold true, sometimes there will be litigation in spite of these various norms, but, for, but to a large measure, measure there are a fair number of informal norms that, that actually work in this context. Um, I'm really rushing, so because uh, I know I've run over. But um, so creativity still plays a part. I'll give you the slides, uh, all the, the signaling to formal and informal norms that are here. There's a complex relationship. We as individual actors do this all the time. When we have to discuss fair dealing, what does the word fair mean? Uh, we, we always uh, go to context to decide what is fair and what is not fair with respect to the Copyright Act. We always go to context to decide what's reasonable and not reasonable when we're talking about uh, private law, civil responsibility, torts. Right? 
these kinds of, of contextually based analyses, and I would add contextually based virtue-driven analyses about doing what is right uh, or what ought to be, are, uh, someone said Lon Fuller again, um, are part of what we do as lawyers. I'm not saying anything new here. We do it all the time. We just don't always admit that we do it all the time. Uh, even H.L.A. Hart admitted that we did this uh, in his postscript, that we, 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 sometimes the formal norm will push us as it does when we talk about fair dealing in the formal Copyright Act or when we talk about the reasonable person in the law of tort, sometimes the formal normativity will push us to uh, informal resolution, which, which may very well be based on principles of morality. Um, so we do do this all the time. Uh, and I think that uh, a virtue ethics analysis helps us, uh, sorry, I'm just going to run through this, um, helps us to understand that there are a variety of different sources for uh, answering these kinds of questions. We have to pay attention to context. A black and white rule will be a good source of guidance, but it won't necessarily uh, be or lead us to the right answer in all cases. Uh, it's something that Aristotle understood in his discussion of, uh, uh, of equity or epikaia, um, and it's something that I think we need to understand with respect to copyright. Sorry, that's a, a real cook's tour. Uh, there is a practical example in the paper that I've circulated for Monday's discussion. I think it's open to anyone who's here, uh, if they want to come. Um, and we could, we could think of other examples too. I'm sorry, sorry I've run out of time. But I, I do think it's a fruitful addition to the other kinds of discourses that we see in intellectual property and property, which I'm not, I, I'm not going to say that rights uh, and exclusive rights don't form the basis of property law or intellectual property law. They do, and there are different degrees of exclusivity or exclusion. As between, say, copyright and land law, there's no question that's the case. But I, I do think that there are other discourses that help to frame uh, and perhaps control some of the excesses uh, that relying too heavily on one set of justifications or another might uh, might lead towards. So that's it. Thank you.